Okay, welcome everyone to the Asheville City Work Session um, on baseball and other things. Um, we are going to be talking about the um, about McCormick Field, the city of Asheville's field, and uh, and Council. Just so you know, the, and the public, this is a work session. We are not being asked to take a vote necessarily at the end of this meeting. It is more for everyone's information, and then. Um, uh, you know, whether or not we want staff to continue to work on this is essentially the, the question that will be put to us. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it over to Chris Coral to give us the presentation, unless we're starting with you, Deborah, or Chris. Yes, yes. You don't okay, mind. thank you. So um, good evening, afternoon, whatever time it is. Um, I want to just start by actually saying happy Valentine's Day to everyone. Yes. Right, right. And then You're secondly, awesome. to thank <laughs> council. Um, it has been a, a long day. Some of you have had committee meetings and now work session. And then we run right into the business meeting. We have a extremely dense presentation for you all. Uh, it's a lot of slides. So we're going to go ahead and get started. And uh, Chris Coral and Tony um, McDowell are going to be doing most of the, the presentation. Um, but I'm going to open with uh, the, the key takeaways. And um, you all know my approach is in terms of key takeaways, it is begin, <clears throat> excuse me, begin with the end in mind. Um, I want to leave you with some of the key messages that you will see through a much more detailed, dense presentation, as I stated. Um, so I'll get started. Key takeaways. Um, McCormick Field is not just a, a, a pretty important local asset, but it's a pretty important regional asset. We currently own the facility, and over the years, unfortunately, it's not been adequately maintained. And you will see a lot of the details um, about additional things that are that are needed, whether we have um, a minor league baseball team or not. However, the facility has been principally used by and been leased out to a minor league baseball team, the tourists. We feel again that whether the facility is used by the tourists or not, we still have to make an investment in that facility. We think, in particular, this facility can be used for many other purposes to derive broader community benefit. Um, we think that the investment will help us potentially turn what could be, if we don't invest, a liability into a much bigger asset for not just minor league baseball, but for our entire community. Now, to retain the, the Major League Baseball affiliation in Asheville, we do have to make some significant renovations that are in line with what they require in terms of minimum standards for these types of facilities, and there is an impending deadline. We have got to communicate back before um, April 1st or thereabouts with a commitment letter uh, this year. Uh, we have been discussing this over several months, so I don't want anybody to feel as though, well, how, how long have you, you know, this is the last minute. This is not the last minute. We have been talking about this um, for a while, and I think we are approaching, obviously, the deadline, but also, I think, um, a fairly strategic approach to, to making these improvements. However, we cannot do it alone. That is, the city can't do it alone. A funding plan will require assistance from lots of partners, the team, the county, TDA, and possibly even the state uh, of North Carolina. Also, to absorb this project on the city side, uh, our existing capital improvement plan, either um, additional resources will be needed or existing items will possibly will need to be reprogrammed. So we will have, uh, again, a lot more detail about what those projects may be and potentially how we can um, 
help in um, making the improvements uh, for this facility. And now I'll we'll turn it over to you, Chris, to run through the rest of the presentation. Thanks. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, Chris Coral, Director of the Community and Regional Entertainment Facilities Department. Uh, we've baked in a lot of question opportunities. Uh, Brian DeWine, the owner of the team, is here as well today. So if there are questions that I can't answer and he can, he's available as well. Uh, just to get briefly into it, I'm going to try to go through the history portion fast so that we have more time in the meat of the presentation. But this facility opened in 1924. It was last renovated in 1992 by the county, who then owned the stadium. It's 4,000 seats, sits on eight and a quarter acres, and it replaced the stadium that was down on Choctaw Street. Um, the long, long history of the land, if you can go way back, it was Eastern Band of Cherokee Indians, most likely, as far as I can find, and our title search work, uh, Susan Buchanan owned it until 1922, when it was sold off to Wilbur Devendorf, who sold it to the city. We transferred it to the county in 1984 as part of the water agreement. It came back to the city in 2005 uh, with the cancellation of the water agreement, and we have owned it since. How we got here with these renovations. So in 2015, when the team was affiliated with the Colorado Rockies, they began pushing for upgrades at McCormick. Parks and Recreation and the Tourists commissioned a facility study which recommended around $6 million in improvements. Uh, minimal improvements were made as a result directly from that, about 80,000. We have sunk tens of thousands into the facility over the years on things like HVAC and water heating and other repairs, but that was the immediate fix from that study. In 2019, Major League Baseball announced a plan for contraction of the minor leagues, and teams were evaluated on their geographical positioning and the facilities that they had. Then in 2020, that came to fruition with 160 teams dropping down to 120. 42 total teams lost their license. Two Indies got teams in. That's why that math doesn't work out. And uh, the tourists nearly lost their affiliation license in that process. And during that process, they went from the Rockies to the Houston Astros, which they're affiliated with today. So also in 2019, Major League Baseball advised of new facility standards that were going to be developed. Uh, this was an upgrade from the 1990 facility standards. And 2020, they also issued new franchise licenses to all the remaining 120 teams. So our team has a license for affiliation through 2030. And that's the same across the United States. There's no market that has a license agreement longer than through 2030. 2020, the new facility standards came out with a rubric scoring system. So think about it like a reverse health score. The higher your points, the worse it is, so you wanna be lower. And the way that rubric requirement works, we need to be under 30 points by April 1st of this year, 20 points by 24, 10 points by 2025. We're currently at 177 points, which is obviously way high compared to what Major League Baseball would like. And that puts us in the bottom 10% of all minor league facilities. That's the bottom 12 facilities in the country. Our highlight failures are a lack of female facilities for the umpires, coaches, support staff. So that's the training rooms, everywhere back of house. And if you've taken a tour of the facility, it's very confined. So adding those spaces is going to be really challenging. Uh, there's no security command post, which the team is working on this year to try to set up a temporary setup for that. There's no secured player parking exercise workout room and hitting tunnel is under the left field bleachers, very confined and not an ideal situation for professional sports. The commissary and dining areas are really tight. They're literally around the corner from toilets. Um, it lacks the infrastructure to support the modern technology that's needed in baseball and other professional sports. The training room is really a nook more than a training room. Foul poles, field grading, field drainage are an issue there. Field lighting, the batter's eye, which is the dark area in center field so they can see the baseball coming in when it's pitched is too small. And media facilities are similar to a high school football field. So our facility has some general shortcomings outside of Major League Baseball's <clears throat> needs. So the 2015 report identified that like many of our other city facilities, McCormick Field systems are at or past their useful life expectancy. That's stormwater, exhaust systems, HVAC, the masonry, handrails and step supports. We're up to code, but the code of when it was built. So as things are renovated, they need to come up to code. And so we're in a constant Band-Aid repair at that facility. Good break for questions. Any questions on the history, how we got here? Can we go back a slide? Yeah. 
I think I know the answer to this, but when I did the behind the scenes tour, I noticed there were some structural issues with like metal that was rusted out, stormwater issue that seemed like maybe um, structural issues with beams. Does that fall under somewhere in this list? It seemed pretty important if we're going to maintain the facility with or without baseball. Yeah, it's uh, so this is not an exhaustive list. I got through page about 40 of 150 and was running out of space on the slide. So yes, <laughs> there's. Um, we'll get into the details of minimum requirements for the facility, minimum for Major League Baseball, fan improvements in a future slide. But yeah, that would be included in that minimum for the facility, like structural issues, HVAC, plumbing, like those are things we need, whether it's a minor league team there or some other tenant. Okay, thank you. Oh. All right, oh, so next slide actually. <laughs> so we have two different projects that we're showing you today, uh, the full project and a minimum project to meet Major League Baseball standards. So the 19.6 million that you see at the top are those minimum needs to meet Major League Baseball standards. The facility operational minimum needs, that's the civil, structural, and MPE, that's that 5.6 million. So that's where we're hitting some structural issues, some storm water, piping, HVAC. Um, a bucket that we created of strongly recommended for pro sports, so that's video displays, the front entrance, ingress, egress, picnic areas, those are areas that you're gonna need for any type of pro sport, whether it's a high level independent baseball league, concerts, like any type of professional environment whenever it comes to sports or events. Um, and then fan amenities, interactive displays, which is additional video displays, a wraparound concourse that has 360 access, so that's better access for concessions and other activities at the games or other events. And what we wanted to show here is the difference between the full project and the minimum project really takes away fan amenities and things that are strongly recommended for pro sports. And we couldn't completely eliminate those two areas because for example, the picnic area would be, that's currently there, would be completely displaced in order to upgrade the home, club, the home clubhouse. So we would need to replace that in order to keep the club at like a similar or same level of revenue generation opportunity. And the scoreboard that's currently there would have to come out to deal with some retaining walls, so we would have to replace that. So this would be like a smaller version of video board asset in the interactive displays and the fan amenities. Comparable markets. So a lot of questions come up on how other markets fund these types of facilities. Uh, I've got data from 34 different markets. Over 75% are funded publicly, and that's nearly all cases as far as like 75% of the money into the project. Uh, there's a few small examples where it's mostly publicly funded. Uh, Greenville, South Carolina is one of those examples, but most are 100% or 75 public funding in different buckets. It's not all from one entity, similar to what we're talking about today, where it'd be multiple groups coming in to help fund the project. All of the newer stadiums post-2014 have agreements that require multi-use over more than just baseball and have a long-range CapEx plan so that we don't run into that issue again in the future. And we'll talk about both of those later today. And all have a legal tether for affiliated baseball. And so in our lease, which we'll talk about later, that we've worked out with the ownership group, we would have a legal tether for affiliated baseball through 2030, which means a tie to a major league team, in this case, the Astros, and a legal tether to the ownership group for professional baseball through the end of the lease, which would be about 10 years longer. And the difference there being major league baseball, like I mentioned earlier, only has given out licenses through 2030. So we can't guarantee major league baseball will give us affiliation, but we can guarantee that the ownership group keeps professional baseball, whether it's independent or affiliated teams after that 2030 mark. Um, additionally, inside that tether, if the team is sold, whoever buys the team can't pick it up and move it to another market, it has to stay in our market. So that way we're guaranteeing that we have access to our team through 20 plus years. So the tourists in the community, Economic impact to Buncombe County in uh, 2021, I believe it was, we got the report in January of 2022, was uh, $9.8 million per year with an average annual attendance just under 180,000. Um, they have a lot of other little buckets on how they are inside the community. Their community and nonprofit concession program directly paid 
all of these nonprofit and community groups, 140,000, a little more than $140,000 last year in 2022 for helping work in their concession stand. To give you comparison to the Harris Cherokee Center, so we're a 12 month operation with the same program. Uh, the tourists are operating from April to September. We only paid out $200,000 last year. So their per game payout is actually higher than our facility to the community groups. I don't think a lot of people are aware of that of these programs, but if you have a parent, if you're a parent of a band student, yes. <laughs> you certainly are. But um, but anyway, I mean that we do that the tourists do this, but we also do it at the at mm -hmm. Harris Cherokee and allow nonprofits to run these snack yeah. bars and make the proceeds. It's yes. very fun. I highly recommend it. I really enjoyed it with Asheville Middle. <laughs> yeah. uh, so the tourists in the last two years um, have worked with 191 different local WNC vendors. 12% uh, at least of their, of their vendor spend in 2022 is with MWBE businesses. That was only the businesses that they were certain were MWBEs. Uh, going through all that list in the last week, there could be others in there too. They sell 20 different locally made food or beverage products in their concession stands and catering operation. And 50% uh, of their front office staff are women uh, the national average in professional baseball is 29.2. They have 149 full and part-time positions, and they estimate that they provide about 40 first-time jobs every season to new kids up and coming. Uh, and just their fun fact of locally brewed beers and ciders, a little over 73,000 sold a year. They also, through in-kind and cash, uh, provide 630,000 in community contributions annually and $50,000 uh, in need-based scholarships annually, annually through the family. <clears throat> they partnered with the Parks and Rec Adaptive League, which affects about 60 kids every year, and they do around 80 community appearances. Uh, the reading program, which is a COVID casualty, was up to 10,000 students in a year. Um, pre-COVID, it is coming back this season with the goal of getting back to that number in the near future, but it has not been in place since 2019. Chris, before you leave that slide, can you explain a little bit more about the Park and Rec Adaptive League? Yes, I know a little bit about the Adaptive League. It is for um, kids that uh, either have a physical ailment or a mental ailment that does not allow them to play baseball in the normal little leagues and I don't know a, a lot about that, but Parks and Rec runs it through the Therapeutic Rec program. Yep. Thank you. Yep. So what is the impact of not funding this project? So we remain to have an inadequate facility that's gonna have needs no matter what we decide to do with that facility in the future. Uh, the club will lose their license with Major League Baseball and become un unaffiliated. We'll continue to have a facility that lacks female facilities throughout the property if used for other uses. Um, it is possible to recruit an independent team. It's possible that the current ownership would create an independent team to play in Asheville, but there's a big difference between affiliated and non-affiliated teams. Affiliated team, there's a direct path to the major league for the players and coaches alike. With an independent team, you're trying to get back to the minor league, so your quality of play goes down. But most importantly for us as the city, the total game count goes down on average from 66 to 35. And data from 35 different markets show that their attendance reduction from 2019 to last season was 25% for the teams that lost their affiliation in that contraction and continued to move forward. And there were multiple teams that completely folded and just have vacant stadiums sitting in those communities at the moment. It's assumed that a similar reduction to economic impact would also be part of that factor. So we'd theoretically go from around 10 million a year to closer to seven, seven and a half, assuming all other things stayed the same. Another good break for questions. I have a couple. Um, <clears throat> slide, gosh, what number? Um, where we're talking about um, contingency. I'm just curious. It just says there's contingency. Are we any idea of what or how much? And then my follow-up question is going to be, I saw where there's the guarantee of the tourists through 2030, or I guess baseball affiliation yes. through 2030. And then after that, it would be some other possible affiliation. But is there a potential for the league to contract again? 
Um, so I'll answer the contingency question first. So contingency, um, these numbers were based on a 2021 construction estimate that we then add, add, added right. escalators to, but the contingency in different areas was anywhere from 15 to 25%, depending on which portion of the project. So there's a significant amount of contingency in there. That's helpful. Um, as far as future contraction, Major League Baseball has stated at least through 2030, they're not gonna contract. After that, you know, things could change. I would be surprised they've, you know, before 2020, many teams had as many as five minor league teams, and now they all have four. So reducing even more would seem illogical, but possible. Yeah. And maybe that's why the 2030 mark. Okay, yeah. thank you. I had a question on this slide also. Um, so I appreciate how this is broken down. It really is helpful to understand, to see clearly like this 5.6 is needed to just care for this facility no matter what. Um, <clears throat> and then um, the line item, strongly recommended for pro sports. When you were presenting, you also mentioned that it so that line item might also be pro sports or pro events in general. Could you speak to that a little more? Yeah. So. If we go back in time, uh, the tourists hosted a pretty large concert a few years ago at the Florida Georgia Line in Nelly and had around 11,000 people at it. And it, it was a cluster. It, it just didn't work well. Like getting people in and out of that stadium when you have more than three, 4,000 people is really, really hard. If you've been there, the gate's about 13, 14 feet wide. If you open the maintenance gate too, now you've got a total of maybe 20 feet to get people in and out of. So there's not a lot of access to get in and in out. Additionally, these extra picnic areas, the suites, your more concourse space allows you to sell more concessions, more food and beverage, more vendors if you do craft fairs and other similar events, and just space for people to move. And when you do really large events or even sold out baseball games, if you've been there on a Friday night on a dollar dog night, it's hard to move. And you don't really enjoy that experience, so you're not gonna spend as much, you're not gonna move, you might not even go. So just creating that flow of people is really important. And that's what a lot of the strongly recommended for pro sports is, is just space, getting more footprint. And it sounds like it's, it could also be said that it's strongly recommended for just professional events. Because yes. part of what struck me from the earlier slide is that a significant portion of folks who've done renovations since then have contracts that are multi-use, that this isn't, mm -hmm. that a lot of best practice is that this isn't just a baseball stadium, it's a community event space. Yes. And we know how much awesome work has been put into our civic center to be an event space. And this mm -hmm. might could be another place to bring people for folks to come, whether they love baseball or not. Um, but that, that doesn't just happen with the uh, facility operational minimal needs, right? To, to really scale up to have multi-purposes, we might want investments for those purposes as well. Yeah, the, using the Civic Center as a great example, so in total about 16 million has been put into that building over a seven year period. So before that renovation, the annual gross revenue at that facility was like 1.92 million a year on average. This year, we're going to bring in around 5.4 million. So huge change. And so you're going to see something similar with either one of these projects at the baseball stadium. But that change is going to be more significant with the full project, which will add more events, more impact around the community and throughout the South Slope in general. So um, one of the things that this doesn't address, and I'm looking at other cities that are choosing what to do with their public parks is what we're doing right now. Um, there is not only a financial cost savings, but there's a environmental impact of adaptive reuse um, instead of a city that's maybe considering knocking down a whole facility and rebuilding. Um, and I think that we haven't communicated that to the public, that there is not only a savings, but an environmental impact. Um, but as we're looking for those cautionary tales of cities that have lost their team and maybe want our team, um, I do appreciate the benefits and the uh, focus on local and minority women-owned businesses. But can we, I guess, the, there's a big jump from in that slide, if we can go back. Sorry, it moved. Oh, you want this one? This okay, one, sorry. yeah. There's a big jump from 1.5 to 7. And I think it would help if we broke that down and like mm -hmm. thought about like what, how are we going to use this space for more than baseball? and. Why does it need to be that big of a jump if it's going to be more for more than sports? 
And one of the things I'm curious about, we're seeing facilities like this being used for ice skating or for concerts, graduations, weddings. Um, maybe we don't have to make that big of a jump in the either orness of this. Yeah, and we have the breakdown of that difference, so we can certainly bring that back to this group. I do have a question along the lines of what Kim was saying, but it's not related to the money. I'm wondering what community engagement we've had regarding additional usage with the surrounding neighborhoods. Uh, so far, the club has run point on working with the neighborhoods, specifically initially to talk about uh, fireworks and how often fireworks are shot, which we'll get to later. But yeah, that, that was one of the topics we were gonna get into later with the events is the impact on the community. That's part of the pros, cons, is if we want to get more out of the facility, that's gonna bring more people to that area more often. And so that's part of the conversation that needs to be had. But there's not been community meetings or any direct community output. Or Will there be any community meetings before we vote? I suppose there can be. Us, yes. Absolutely. Yeah. I know we talked about this um, before, but in that phasing of how many people are going to use the facility for non-baseball events, I know we've talked about a flat number. Is it possible to contract in a percentage increase over time? Because I think there's probably a way to do some focused outreach with the neighborhood to see what the needs and de desires are of using this space and what the impact would be if we, like, where's the threshold of where we're headed? And also, how can we engage the neighborhood more? I think if we're going to add a, an escalator onto a minimum amount of additional attendees outside of baseball every year, uh, we have to be cognizant that if we're asking the team to do that and we're going to penalize them if they can't meet that, but we're also going to ask them to be very careful about how they impact the neighborhood, there's the lines cross somewhere there, right? Like if we say we need you to bring in 50,000 more people, but the neighborhood's only ready for 10,000, are we going to then penalize them when we ask them to step down the amounts of events that happen there? And so we just have to decide where that nexus is. Right. So um, thinking about neighborhood resiliency, which is a goal of this council, um, and food security, I am also curious. I know we've, I've talked with the um, owner of the team about this. It's not necessarily requiring the whole use of space. There's mm -hmm. a parking lot. Could it be tailgate markets? Can it be food truck events? Like there's there's probably a way to get that number to meet the needs of the neighborhood so long as we're communicating with the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Well, and I wonder how many of those would be a team run event versus the city. city. I mean, it's a city facility. We could, yep. you know, if, we're, if that's what the desire is. And that would definitely be part of the mix when we're talking into the lease that we have access to dates, certain times of year, first access, the rest of the time, second after baseball, just with how the scheduling has to work. And so we could work out tailgate markets. We've talked to the ownership group. like. Parking lot is the easiest space because that's passive events that are in and out. The hardest things are concerts and the ice skating that somebody brought up. Things like that are much harder than the easy food trucks in and out or a tailgate market on a Saturday morning. Chris, when, we're, when planning this, I see parking, like it needs more specific parking. I'm reminded that the memorial field users were upset about cars being parked there and i'm just wondering if that's woven into here yeah we haven't had anybody park on the field since whenever that was okay. uh, but parking we'll talk about in the lease but is okay. address um, team parking public parking i'm kind of envisioning this as part of that south slope vision plan which has not yet been adopted but this is a piece in that plan, and in that plan in front of the stadium, there's access for parking to be built in the future. Okay. One last question before you move on. The next slide after this, where it says, you know, mostly major subsidies from public in all the cases you reviewed, did we see any that didn't have any public participation? Um, off the top of my head, Greenville was the closest. Oh, in the actual that. stadium, there was no public funding, but the public funding went right outside the stadium. I think it was around $7 million in infrastructure okay. funding. Okay. And the uh, municipality put $4 million into the old stadium that the team left. So there was okay. public input, but not directly for the team stadium. That's what I was remembering. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. I have, well, I have another question. Yeah. Um, back on the the renovations slide that shows the breakdown. Um, so what I'm spending a lot of time thinking about is how, how many of our neighbors love baseball and how many folks really want this to happen and how a lot of people feel really disconnected from baseball and, and don't see the value. 
And to me, this is a really special place that can be for all of us, whether you love baseball or not. And this is a major opportunity for us to look into this being more of a public space. So with that preamble, when I look at kind of the list and the conversation, I think a lot of the, my understanding is a lot of the things on the list really came out of um, the baseball team saying, hey, we gotta meet these MLB standards and here is what we would love as your lead tenant. And my kind of question is, stepping away from the major league baseball mandates and what we know from facilities, are there things that haven't really been put on this list that would have started from our vision for how this thing could grow as opposed to um, have originated from the suggestions from the baseball team? Uh, short answer is yes. So the study was done in 2016 at that point before there were Major League Baseball standards coming down. And the goal at that point was how do we renovate this stadium for baseball? So at that point, we actually had a clause in our lease that they weren't allowed to do an event for more than 1,000 people without written permission from the city. So it was truly a baseball stadium only. So these budget figures and these assets that we would be renovating and building would be baseball first, other events second. So if we went at it with a different lens, using a budget figure, for example, like if 37 and a half million is greenlit and we move forward, we could design with that budget, but more multi-purpose in mind. And whether that's additional indoor space or different spaces in the concourse designed in a different way so other events can fit in a better way, all of those things are possible, but these numbers, yeah, are based off of a baseball focus in 2016. All right. All right, so um, financing details. Tony, were you going to take it from here? Do you have one more? Uh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> All right. <laughs> So financing details, how we would do this, right? Um, so the city of Asheville would need to seek debt financing from the local government commission. We would partner with the club, the team, the TDA, possibly the state of North Carolina. The LGC and Major League Baseball would require documentation of financial commitments and expected documents would include a 20 year longer lease agreement with the club, our city debt package, a resolution from the county and a commitment from the TDA and any bulk revenue that would come in, like the state or any other bulk revenue situations would be used to reduce the total cost of debt. So we get into lease deal points. So two different projects. So first we're gonna talk about what the lease deal points would look like with the full project, and then we'll talk about the minimum project. So if we so, move- uh, And on yeah. your previous slide, I think the way it should be worded is the LGC would have to approve our, right? I mean, we don't actually, they don't lend money, they just, yeah, they're like the it. oversight oh, bodies. Yeah. yeah. So if we move forward with the, with the full project, the team's lease payment, right now they have a lease that runs through the 2023 season for $1 per year. So we would void that lease and write a new lease that would be for 22 years. So two years pre-construction and then 20 years covering the debt service. And so their lease payment would immediately jump in the current conditions to 25,000 per year and the team's putting in around 100,000 in investments for temporary women's facilities and other needs for Major League Baseball this year to help bridge the gap until construction. Next year, that lease payment would stair step to 100,000, and then once we closed the project and moved forward with the 20 years, uh, we'd go five years at 450,000 a year, and then the next 15 at $475,000 a year lease payments. Uh, the last 10 years of that, there'd be an additional $1 paid for each attendee over 175,001. So in our current attendance numbers, we'd already be earning some extra dollars on top of that. And it's presumed that after a renovation, we would have a boost in attendance because that tends to happen everywhere that puts money into public facilities like this. So that makes their average lease payment over the 20 year term 468,750 a year. There's also a requirement that they bring in 35,000 non-baseball attendees to events at the facility annually. And there's a 50 cent penalty per head if that target's missed. So the, the deep, deep details on that, naming rights would stay 100% with the club. Uh, council would still have the ultimate authority over approving the final name. So they'd have to bring it to this group, similar to when Harris Cherokee bid on the Civic Center and we went through that process. 
but they would incur 100% of the revenue and expense to work through the naming rights process. The club would have 100% to sponsorship and advertising. This is consistent with their current lease. Um, we would receive mutually agreeable time in their digital assets for advertising either for Harris events, Parks and Rec, job posting, whatever we want to put out there as the city. Um, the team would retain 100% of the ticket management. The city would receive the equivalent of eight season tickets per year, or each year. We'd have a city of Asheville night and one night in the suite. Um, similar to an employee program we did last year, we had the opportunity to allow every employee two different games a year they could attend for free. So that's what these tickets would be used for. Uh, food and beverage would re remain with the club who operates it currently, but they must maintain the A health rating. Um, no permitted programming at Memorial Stadium on game days. That's consistent with the current and past lease. Uh, we don't program two big events at the same time. Um, Department of Community and Regional Entertainment facilities would have first rights on dates from the first day after the season through uh, October 31st. So that would be specifically targeting concerts and other special events. We'd have access to dates throughout the rest of the year, second to baseball. So the team would have first rights to those dates. On the events that we would host, um, there would be a 50-50 split of the net bar tickets, sponsorship sales, essentially of the net revenue of the event would be a 50-50 split with the team. And um, concerts of that scope and scale have, have a pretty good uh, return. Um, for example, we'll have an event later this month that the bar numbers should net somewhere in the neighborhood of $22 a head. So there's great opportunity for advanced revenue here, especially when we're talking about uh, five, six, seven, eight thousand person concerts. On average, you're going to see around eighteen dollars a head, depending on the type of show. Uh, parking. So the team would have twenty four seven, three sixty five access to the front lot, which is in front of the stadium. Um, on game days, they'd have access to a parking lot at Hunt Hill and a parking lot at, on, at Mountainside Park, which is the entrance to Memorial Stadium. So that would be for players, teams, coaches and some public parking that they would run. And we would keep access to that front lot in the sense that we would be able to make that a sellable asset. So if we worked with a partner in some way, shape or form to either build a parking deck in the future or develop that land, our lease doesn't give them that um, parking lot forever during the term of the lease, we could come back in and renegotiate that portion if we were to sell it or develop that land. Uh, property maintenance would stay the same as it has been for the last 10 plus years where the club does day to day upkeep and the city handles trade and structural issues. So the easy thing, the club plunges the toilet, we put the toilet back on the wall. Uh, easy things like that. Well, and, and, and not, uh, that's a good way yeah. to put it. And but no, that shift happened 10 has it been 10 years? I think it's been almost 15. Mm, I definitely was around it was when 2012, I switched. Because I, I feel like maybe? we were subsidizing. Yeah. So this was a big deal. We used to actually have to pay for operations. Yes. And we, made the, we switched it so that the city was no longer involved in operations, but only in mm -hmm. capital. So that was shortly thereafter, I think, we, the new seating went in. Yeah. Maybe toilets too, but seating yeah. for sure. And I think that's also when the lease switched to $1 a year. 2012. Yeah. Okay. And all right, so to continue with the future lease deal points, the city would take utilities and we would pay those utilities throughout the year and use their lease payments to cover that cost. Uh, license and service agreements would be 100% that of the club. So that's like elevator agreements, video board services, etc. There's a request to waive firework permit fees and to increase the total number of firework shows to a maximum of 15 plus federal holidays and to waive the no back-to-back -back rule on holiday weekends. So the current maximum count is 12. So that's adding three more and then depending on how the calendar falls on a given year, it could be four or five more just based on what day of the week federal holidays fall being Labor Day, July 4th and Memorial Day. And the back-to-back -back on holiday weekends is key um, in that you could shoot on Sunday of Memorial Day weekend, for example, and then also on Monday for Memorial Day, or if July 4th falls on a Sunday and you want to have a Saturday fireworks show on a Sunday. So those are significant revenue days for the team to help them get up to those higher lease payments. 
There's also a request for a capital improvement plan and annual budget. So the club, in addition to their lease payments, would bring in or would commit to 75,000 per year towards mutually agreeable types of assets that would be capital improvements. So that'd be physical improvement to the uh, stadium itself, or it could be new equipment and food and beverage, or uh, new field lighting, whatever it might be. But they would do that every year with the ability to roll over so they could save up money for a bigger project, say in year five, six, or seven. And if the end of our lease term concludes and they have not spent 75,000 per year, they would owe the balance back to us at the end of the lease. Um, we would additionally put in 25,000 per year for upkeeps and repairs. Uh, so that's your water heater goes out or fix this leak, whatever it might be. And then any unused amount from that 25,000 would roll into CapEx for future projects down the line. And then there's a request for a planned program of 4 million in year seven and year 14 for improvements at the stadium. Just knowing that there's going to be things in the future that we're gonna feel like we need to improve on or add or new equipment, whatever that might be, and pre-programming in the opportunity for additional improvements in the future. So before I go into the minimum lease, the minimum project lease. Any questions on that? I probably should have broke, put a question break in there. Can you give us a, a range, I'm sorry, yeah. of the utilities cost? Uh, yeah, it roughly is a value of about 75,000 a year. Okay. On that finance I can get that exact page. number, but it's close to I that. just needed a range. Yeah. So. Sorry. On that finance page, you, um, it indicates something along the lines of partnership between the city, the county, and TDA. What happens if either of those entities does not wish to move forward. We'll get into that in a little bit, but our our commitment should be contingent upon the county and TDA so that we have the ability to pull our money back and decide what else to do with that stadium if they decide not to come aboard as well. Can we go to the slide where it talks about fireworks? Okay. I have reached out to the Neighborhood Association. I haven't heard back yet officially, but I have talked to neighbors um, who live in East End Valley Street, and I would be really surprised if there was a, a, a broad support for more concerts and fireworks and noise, mm -hmm. um, unless we're talking really, like, frankly, about the benefits to the community. Um, I do appreciate that a lot of the questions that I've, I've asked, like 27 questions in just this list alone, and a lot of them are answered. Um, Things like who benefits from the contracting to um, the Asheville Royal Giants being recognized as championship 1946, 1947 players, um, how to connect with more of our youth, how to connect with more neighborhood programming. But I really would love to, to, to hear from neighborhood that this is, this is a benefit, because I'm not hearing that right now, um, when we have so many benefits that we could be focused on in the use of our space. So, so I think some of that will have to come from us in terms of the direction and not, you know, at some point we kind of are directing policy rather than staff continuing to serve up options to us. Um, and one thing that I, and I think you're right, this is, this is a, been a neighborhood issue in terms of impacts and what is, what is, um, uh, what level of impact is the neighborhood willing to you know, put up with, I, I mean, basically. Um, and to me, one thing that I think we should explore, because I think what we're going to get into is doing the higher version of this redo of this facility will allow more uses. For example, concerts. Well, if you're living in the neighborhood, what, what would motivate you to want to deal with six to 12 concerts a year that will generate a lot of revenue? I think we need to have a conversation with the neighborhood about and the community about what is a way we could, what could we do with those revenues? What could we do that would benefit up more directly um, the neighborhoods so that that would make sense um, from a community standpoint? And then what, what I'm hopeful staff can do is kind of give us what those numbers and projections look like, what those options are so that we can have a deeper dive with, with folks to figure out what's acceptable. Right, like I do hear a lot of requests for more family-friendly, affordable events. I do hear a request for support of the Easton Valley Streets dental program. I do hear a desire to have like graduation focus or mm -hmm. festival focus, art show Absolutely. focus, like that sense of belonging that's gonna connect with our families and our neighborhoods. I don't hear this, so I, I, I get it, I just. Yeah. 
I know that's our work. I just want to make sure that by the time we're making a decision on this, we have some of those questions answered for the neighborhood. Okay. One more quick clarifying question. Um, so it looks like 2025 is when things might actually be done and the official you know, leasing of a full rate goes mm -hmm. into play. And are we calling that year one? Yes. Okay. So for seven years, they'll pay us roughly $470,000 in rent. But then at the end of that seventh year, we need to give $4 million back to the facility. That's the request. I was surprised by the four and seven or the seven year and 11 year mark. Yeah. So year seven would be 2032. Year 14 would be 2039. In, in so they would have paid about 3.2 million in lease payments. But we've then got to spit out four more million. That's Under this, that's the proposal. Yeah. Okay, I guess I missed that piece. <laughs> okay, uh, so with the minimum project moving forward, um, this one's actually pretty easy um, because most of the things that come out are additional revenue generators for the team. They don't have the flexibility to get as high with lease payments. So they'd still move up to 25,000 per year this year, 50,000 next year, and then we would be stair stepping at 250,000 for five years, 275 for the next five, 300,000, and then 325. And those last 10 years, again, we'd have the $1 per paid attendee over 175,000. Um, we would also reduce the non baseball attendee number from 35,000 per year to 15,000. And all other deal points that we just went over would remain the same. So any questions on the second lease option? Yes. I was just looking at the club lease deal uh, points, and I mean, I, the city of Asheville, of course, you know, uh, appreciate the eight season tickets, but this is basically for us. Mm -hmm. I was wondering, is there any kind of benefit that we could actually have in here uh, from the team that actually could give back to the community as far as maybe a certain percentage of free tickets, you know, for people in the community cuts, you know, baseball tickets and things like that are very expensive. And, you know, we would, a lot of people in the community that would love to enjoy these, you know, luxuries, unfortunately cannot afford to. So I was just wondering, is there anything that we could put in here that would actually benefit, uh, uh, you know, the community? So a lot of that's already happening. Uh, that's inside that 630,000 community contribution number I mentioned earlier that's in-kind tickets, among other things. But um, I would assume, I might have to pass to Brian here, but if we moved up through these projects, those programs would likely expand. So you'd have more and more people that get access to free tickets um, or highly discounted tickets. And there's a few different programs that you guys do with that, right? And I guess what I'm concerned about, I'm just concerned about, even though you have all these programs, about uh, the benefits trickling down to those that are, you know, <laughs> sort of, you know, in that lower income level, because I understand that they do have raffles and free tickets or whatever, but sometimes it does not trickle down to the community that basically could benefit the most. I, th I think there's probably an opportunity that we can weave in a Parks and Rec tie that somehow works through their programming that's contractually obligated on the tourist side as well as on the city side to work together on Parks and Rec programming that might not be just like baseball and athletics that might be tied to the community centers in some way, shape, or form. I don't know what that is off the top of my head, but I'm sure that we can figure something out that fits that. It sounds yeah. like the answer is yes. And the details would yeah, need we'll to just to, be yeah. worked out. Down. Okay, thank yeah. you. Yeah, I'd like to emphasize my support of that. We did receive an email from someone that yes. has managed a lot of our communities that are uh, on vouchers or lower income, and they spoke directly to this, the unaffordability for the families. Yes. Yeah, and the, I know the team does a lot of programs already, but, but I think we're adding a layer to that yeah. here in terms of direct benefit. Okay. While we're layering in community benefits, um, of the four buckets of questions that I presented um, for me is economic development opportunities. If you're in proximity to the stadium, there's an economic benefit. Um, and we do see a lot of local beer. So I think the question I'm hearing the most around this is how can we see more local businesses, minority owned businesses represented in, in beyond beer um, from like our local breads, sweets, condiments, hot sauces. If, if the goal is to expand the shop, 
can we see more local businesses represented there and not just locally produced but locally distributed? I know there's already an effort there, and so we know that there's an economic development opportunity, but once again, who's benefiting? Yeah, yeah and of the concessions, that, that 20 locally made products and concessions and catering, I think less than 25% of that's actually beer. So it's, it's different products like Roots Hummus and um, T-shirt printing, things like that. All right, so how would we do this financing? Um, we would approach the TDA and apply for a major works pathway grant. So we would, as part of that grant request, we would request a reallocation of the previously awarded 1.95 million for the Cox Avenue Green Main Street project that we were awarded in um, October of this past year. And staff feels confident that we could go back and reapply and be awarded that money or maybe even more in the future and it would not have a significant impact on the other, on the Cox Avenue project. Additionally, we would request a debt service grant from the TDA for a maximum of 15 years in the amount of roughly 1.4 million. And this would be the first debt service grant that the TDA has issued. Um, they've always done one for one grants. That's always what we the city have applied for. We've never applied for a debt service grant, but this is that opportunity to do so, so they can come in at 1.4 million a year for up to 15 years if we were to be awarded the grant. We'd also request that the county commit uh, at least 250,000 per year for 20 years to assist with the project debt service. And that would make the financial plan look a little bit like this for the full project. And I'll show uh, the minimum project next. Um, so it brings the city in at roughly 950,000 per year. So that's our average debt payment It changes every single year. Uh, for a total cost to us, including interest and everything on the quote unquote mortgage at 19 million. So that's 34% of the project. The club would come in at their lease payments, which is about 17% of the project. The county committed for 5 million, which is 9% of the total project. And assuming we were granted the grant from the TDA and reallocation of the Cox Avenue monies, uh, the TDA would be in for a total of 22.95 million, which is 41% of the project. And all of these costs are best estimates. We've been having conversation with staff on each of these groups, but other than the tourist commitment, none of these are commitments until their boards vote on it, just like here. So the minimum project, uh, very similar financing scale, that the difference being the club's ability for input and the likeliness of significant input from the TDA. So the, the club's number comes down, uh, as we talked about earlier, but more importantly, the appetite for the TDA to fund a project like this should go down because it's gonna be a project that can't handle many more of these bigger style extra events outside of baseball. And they need those to help generate the revenue at the hotel rooms to help pay these off. So their number would come down significantly and so the minimum project would actually cost us more than the bigger project long term. So we'd be looking at 46% of the total project, which is $20 million, whereas the TDA would be in just under 30, county at 12%, and the club at 13% of the total project. And for a side-by-side -side comparison of the highlights there, full and minimum side-by-side, -side, you see the, uh, the amount to borrow changes but the city's annual contribution goes up by 50,000 a year, which over the term is about $1 million difference. The TDA's contribution comes down, as well as the clubs. So again, these are best figure estimates. I feel like they're pretty well educated guesses, but they're you know, not final until any other board approves them. All right, and I'm gonna bring up Tony to talk about the future CIP impact. Yeah. I have a question before. If you, well, it's going to be a question for Deborah. Can you go back to the um, financial plan, the maximum one? You see up at the top, um, it indicates that the city would pay $950,000 a year. Um, but I'm also aware that we currently commit $500,000 a year to the housing trust fund and $500,000 a year for reparations. So my question to you is, what do we tell community members when they come to me or you 
and believe that based on these numbers, we're more concerned with um, McCormick Field than we are with affordable housing or reparations. So I would guess um, my response would be that um, to have um, a quality livable neighborhood, there are a range of different types of needs that a community has. And we have a facility, which is a capital facility, uh, an asset that we hopefully could make it potentially an asset. Uh, we know the cost, we know what we can have in terms of economic benefit. Um, I would never suggest that um, an investment in um, a capital asset means that we're, we don't want to or don't care to invest in the other social and economic needs that we have in this community. And so um, if, we, if we look at this for the most part as reparations and affordable housing, I'm just using the examples that you gave, um, are programmatic things that we uh, hope and possibly over time can increase that investment. That's gonna be, uh, that was gonna be my follow-up question. I'm wondering if we can consider moving each of those up to that amount during this budgetary season. Just well, a thought. If I may, I mean, I'm be... always a fan of contributing more to affordable housing, but there, it's almost like a surface glance when it's said that way because we are, the other funds that we're speaking to have other incomes coming to them, whether it's the $25 million in bonds that we did for housing or if it's reparations that receives funding from the community benefits table we set up. So it's a little more complex and nuanced, I'd say, but your point is not lost on me. And if we could get to more funding for all of the above, I think we probably would. And, and, and certainly after the reparations initiative is over, we will have a better, yeah. I think, idea of what is being recommended and what those commitments um, need to be from both the, again, city and, and, and county, as well as with affordable housing, with city, county, Dogwood. Um, so yeah, this is all about partnerships and it is definitely not a value statement about what this community values. We value it all. And that a community of our size with, I think, the, um, the experience that we want for locals and for visitors, um, we need to invest in these types of uses as well as be very, very cognizant about equity, inclusion, and, and definitely uh, having a community where people can afford to live that um, are low and moderate income. So, so we need so to work I, on it all. And what I, I was thinking I'm, about is basically with the stadium, it actually can be a revenue source that we could actually maybe when we, you know, when they start making money, then some, a certain percentage of that revenue for, uh, source can go towards reparations or housing. Uh, basically, you know, because that is a revenue and not just a liability to some degree. Well, that's one of the things I'm curious about because just to lift up um, what Councilwoman Mosley was saying, I'm also hearing that this dollars, dollars show what we value. This is the value of this facility. Um, so when we've got urgency of housing, climate crisis, um, Buncombe County has acknowledged racism as a public health crisis infrastructure burdens, we just saw the water crisis. We don't see st state funding. Like Maryland is dumping state funds into their ballparks as economic development engines because there is an economic development impact um, and a potential for job creation. Um, but we're not seeing the same ask that we would, if this was another economic development opportunity, we'd be asking about living wages, but that's not part of this conversation. But I also don't see as an opportunity to look back. And we are gonna have to, I think, do better about communicating when we make investments, go back and look like, did it help us meet our goals? Because we, we have very clear goals around equity, around economic development, around neighborhood resiliency, but this is a risk. We might not get to keep our team or there may be 
folds in minor league baseball or will there be um, sports and travel in the same kind of way in this timeline of years? So there's a risk associated and it does, I think our dollars do communicate our values. And, and I wanted to tread a little lightly on, on, on this, but I, I'm going to, I'm going to take a plunge. Um, we heard earlier that there was a $9.8 million impact in Buncombe County. And um, figures that we have for the city of Asheville is $7.8 million. And so the majority of what's happening in terms of economic benefit is literally happening in the, the, the city of Asheville. So, you know, if we, if we say it then, for our investment of $19 million, we could get that, we could get some broader community benefit and payback within four to five years. And if we increase the activity in terms of it becoming multi-use, then those, that number would, would, would increase. Yes, the numbers are a statement of value. However, again, uh, for community of our size, the legacy that we have had with this particular facility and its use, uh, we are saying it is, um, and, 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 and no, no pun intended, no offense, it's bigger than a baseball stadium. And that we can do more things, benefit the broader community and the East End community and I think that we can, we can work through a lot of the details about impact and certainly um, over-programming that community. So I'll go ahead and take a second to kind of speak for East End just because I'm frequently in conversation. It's definitely not an issue of East End not liking or the being tourists. friendly with the tourists. Actually, it's just the opposite. Um, again, the tourists gave my brother his first job when he was 14. Um, but there is a concern about what comes next, aside from the tourists, whether what comes next leads to further gentrification. So then, the ideal goal would be, and I can go ahead and say they're not going to be for uh, additional fireworks. That's just, no. Coming up with benefits that benefit the larger community, but with an emphasis on the black and brown communities. I don't know what that looks like, but if we decide to go forward, I would love to um, see a plan for that in off-season time. Yes. Who decides who gets to go into their neighborhood and do whatever it is that we decide they're able to do, where can they plug in to have a say in what happens in their neighborhood? I think is an overarching goal for both the um, Oakhurst neighborhood and East End community. Thank you. I have a question unrelated to that, or if we're good on that particular okay, the topic. The only thing I'm getting worried about is it's time. 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 Yeah, and uh, we're, has, what slide number are we on here? Just mm -hmm. future CIP. I'm not yep. sure what number that is. 29 out of 49. Oh, wow. Can you just speak to whether or not the other parties have been approached about this future $8 million? Are we, is the pitch that we take all of that, or are we sharing bases on that? I'm trying to use some humor. The future $8 million? Yeah. $4 sure. million. Is that just all City of Asheville, or was that split amongst partners? Uh, that's all City of Asheville. However, you know, we have the opportunity to say we would commit, say, one and a half, and then we okay. would approach partners in the future. Thanks. Um, okay. I can be really fast after it. Okay. <laughs> I can be really fast too. Okay. And sorry, I, I wasn't sure which eight million. We've got so many numbers. Yeah. Councilmember Turner, I wasn't sure which ones you're referring to. Okay, just to get to move on. Uh, so Tony McDowell, finance director, I want to talk to you all a little bit about the potential impact of this project on our uh, current future CIP upcoming budget and all that stuff. And so as Chris laid out, um, the total resources required by this project, and when we say total resources here, we're talking about the inter the, the principal on the on the project as well as the interest uh, over the debt over for the 20-year period. Uh, that'll be somewhere in the neighborhood of 19 to 20 million dollars. And 
I do want to point out one thing that Chris mentioned. All of these numbers at this point are estimates, obviously. So as we go on with time, these numbers will be refined. Uh, and so, you know, we may not land exactly on those figures. Um, the thing to know is this funding is not currently included in our multi-year capital improvement uh, debt model. Uh, but we will have to have uh, not only funding in place, but also a financial plan before we go to the LGC, uh, which is the local government commission that we have to go to to seek approval to issue debt for this project. Um, and in order to meet the, the need to have that uh, plan in place and get LGC approval, uh, we'll either have to look at reducing uh, or delaying some planned spending in the five-year CIP, or additional resources will have to be put into the CIP in order for us to pay the debt service on this project. So what, what does that look like? Again, a couple options here. So if the city were to look at uh, delaying or reducing uh, the current CIP, just to kind of give you all some context, uh, we have approximately $69 million in uh, debt-funded projects that are planned over our upcoming five years. Uh, and we have a chart on the next slide that I'll, I'll show you some more detail on that. But the vast majority of that spending is really kind of in two buckets, if, if you will. Uh, it's replacement of existing vehicles and equipment that city staff use. It's about $28 million over five years. And then the other big bucket is street and sidewalk maintenance. That's asphalt resurfacing. Uh, it's repairing existing sidewalk. It's neighborhood sidewalks, new sidewalks, and also pedestrian improvements as well. And that's about $31 million. So one option would be uh, if we wanted to look at the, the projects that are in the existing CIP, uh, we could reduce funding in some of these areas to find, to come up with the resources for this project. Uh, or, and I think this is really specifically for kind of the street and sidewalk and pedestrian improvement areas, we can look at shifting some of that future uh, funding to a future GO bond uh, that council may be considering uh, in 2024. So just to give you all an idea, again, here's a, a detailed list of that, that spending that I, that I mentioned on the previous slide. And I tried to group some of these categories together, but you can, See again, the biggest categories of spending planned are for fleet replacement, uh, street resurfacing, uh, the Livingston Street project, um, and some of the other major projects. And again, those total out to about 68 to $69 million. The kind of second option, if you will, if we don't want to reduce any of the spending that's currently in the CIP, would be to add additional resources to help us pay the debt service uh, over the next 20 years. And the way we would do that is through the annual budget process. And so the timing for this really works out well in that you all are kind of on the cusp of starting the budget process. Actually, we've started already internally, but the conversations with you all will begin um, just here in just a few weeks at your council retreat. But so what we would do is as we go through the budget process this year, we would look at adding additional money into the budget to begin paying the debt service. And our approach to that would be um, the total amount we need, again, is somewhere between 950000 a year to a million a year, depending on which project you all choose. Um, and that would raise our current CIP contribution from about $15.5 million up to roughly $16.45 or $16.5 million. And what we would look to do, because this project is really not going to get underway until after the current season, so we wouldn't need all of the, uh, the money in next year's budget for the, for the debt service, but we would need to show that we're committed to, to that plan uh, in order to get LGC approval. We would recommend that uh, we put somewhere between $450,000 and $500,000 in, in the current budget process and then look at stepping that up over a two-year period so that by the time the project is well underway, we would have that full uh, 950 to $1, or $1 million set aside to pay debt service on this. Um, what that may mean, again, we're going to be having more conversations with you all over the next few months about the budget and the budget process and the priorities that you all identify and that staff identifies. But it might mean that we have to look at, especially in the current year, look at using some of our one-time buckets of funding, things like fund balance or American Rescue Plan to fund some of the other things that are high priority in our budget in order to free up dollars to add money for this project um, to pay the debt service. So I think that is my last slide and I'll be happy to answer any questions on that or turn it back over to Chris. Okay, um, I, I, do, I will just say, and Tony, this isn't a question for you. The, I, I'm, we we're putting in a, a kind of a placeholder number for what the city's debt service could look like, but there's still a lot of negotiating happening here, especially as between the city and the county, because um, you, know, you can see their numbers pretty low. <laughs> 
So, um, so that would, our, our numbers should do nothing but go down uh, as, a, as a result of, of fruitful negotiations. Um, so I don't, you know, I think I'm, I worry a little bit that this is like a being solidified in terms of the communication to the public and I want people to know that it's still under discussion. Do they have a time when they're scheduled to discuss this too? Do they have a work session? They have already had a work session and, um, and but there will need to continue to be conversation. But, uh, so they, they will have to also take action as well at a, you know, at a regular and, meeting, just like we will. And Chris, they have the schedule. Um, I don't know that it's a work session, but I think it's an action. It's a briefing. Briefing. Okay. But yeah, I'll have a uh, schedule okay. moving forward. All right, so, so you're going to blast through these parts about ways yep. to use the facility. Yeah, this part will be quick. <laughs> so these are really just a, a bunch of slides of pictures of what other special events could look like. So minor league baseball stadiums throughout the country do concerts and other special events. Um, you see a lot of winter lights, winter fest style events throughout minor league baseball. Uh, big, big green egg fests, craft fairs, you know, other like passive style events. Mm -hmm. um, you see a lot of cases where those winter lights programs grow over a few years. And as you get that annual group that's going to come every single year, then you see adding of synthetic ice ice skating or other different growth patterns of the winter lights, which we feel like is the biggest opportunity for that ballpark. Concerts are great, but we've already talked about how noise can be a problem. But these passive events, like what you see at the winter lights at Arboretum, you're having a smaller amount of people coming in over a longer period of time. Um, BMX, X game style events, yoga groups, walking groups in the parking lot, farmers markets on a certain day of the week for certain times of years, in and out type of events that really have a great opportunity. Most of these bigger ones though are really contingent on that bigger project because you have to physically drive a stage in on a giant big rig, for example. Um, yes. As a multi-purpose facility, attendance projections, we, we feel like by year five, we can be at about 70,000 per year for non-tourist baseball events with a potential net revenue on the city side or a little over half a million dollars. Um, I feel like especially on the concert side, this is conservative, but that's assuming that we don't have any caps on number of concerts. If we get to the point that we agree to the community that we'll only do say four a year, you know, we're capping ourselves, but if we just go at it as an event venue, that number can really grow pretty quickly. Um, any questions on the multi-use other types of events? I do. Um, how do these um, projections pay into kind of the, play into the deal structure that you're showing us, right? So if we go with a larger project and we're looking at mm -hmm. capital, um, like some of our capital payments of 900,000 and we might get to a point where we're at about half a million a year. Um, is that washed out in the number you're showing us for $900,000 a year? Um, well, I think because we'd be operating versus capital, yeah. it wouldn't be, but it doesn't work the same. In, in theory, eventually we could be earning a good amount of what we're paying annually. Like if yeah. we're, if we do get down to 550 a year because the county steps up their portion by year five, six, seven, we could be washing that out with city revenue. Now these are city events where the city's at risk. So you know, if it rains on a concert day, unless your insurance is really, really good, you're still sure. going to be out some. So like, there's yeah. up and down on that. But yeah. And I think your point is good. You know, just like at home, I might take out a loan to buy my car, but I still have to pay for groceries, and I can't use the same portion of my household budget to cancel it out. The big picture is there's money in and money out, but this money would be towards my daily spending as opposed to my loan, which makes me think of some points that my teammates have talked about of how we do have really pressing community needs that are around affordable housing and reparations and maybe not as directly around recreation, that if this becomes a new operating revenue source, how can we look to that to be pegged towards the community benefit, to be pegged towards affordable housing, to be pegged to that particular neighborhood's ideas for what this programming looks like. Is there a way to kind of, for us to think about that before we're making decisions of what could this new revenue source do in support of the medical that I hear a lot of us sharing around this being a community space yeah. in addition to a baseball space? Yes. 
I want to lend you a brief kudos because when we get to this slide, I start to feel more confident because you have taken this on, but in your other role, you run our Harris Cherokee Center, our Civic Center, our concerts, all this stuff, and you have expertise in that. So I start to feel better when I hear that you're going to be involved in this level of planning. There, there are Ditto. multiple private entities that would love to drop a concert in that facility as soon as it's ready and that do it throughout the country on a regular basis. So we have a lot of opportunities in the concert space. But again, that's the hardest community impact space. And there's more passive events, the craft fairs, the big green egg shows, the food shows. I think we would be leaning on the tourists to run point on projects like that or rent them out to promoters. We'd be going after the free community events. Anything that's tied with parks and rec and, and concerts would be like the city's side of the event space. And I think that's what I hear from folks is like, I'm a baseball fan. When I attend tourist games, I'm in this space with people of all ages and lived experience. Mm -hmm. And it is a way to bring people together. And I hear our youth calling for a place of a sense of belonging. When you consider the history of baseball in Asheville at this location, plus a future history of many memories and community building, I think this gets to that sense of belonging. Yes, agreed. So Chris, we got about t maybe 10 okay. more minutes just to give them at least one break before five o'clock. Uh, so we're down just the last few. So we made a, a pros, cons for the minimum project, maximum, and no project. Uh, I won't read each individual one, but you can see on the minimum project, there's significantly more cons than pros. Uh, but it would meet Major League Baseball. It does keep site programming at similar levels. So your neighborhood parking impact would be similar to what it has been. Uh, the full project kind of flips the script on that. but. There's uh, enhanced flexibility for non-baseball events, a lot of fan side improvements. It's the best project for significant TDA input. Um, it's con, though, is that there's a significant investment in long-term commitment of funds right now. Um, no project is a little more level. Um, so we've, there's no immediate strain for, on the CIP if we don't do a project. Uh, We'll have a reduced impact on the neighborhood, assuming that we lose affiliation and we have an independent league team that plays less often. But we would have eight and a quarter acres of developable land that we could do something with. And what that something is, we don't know. And it would be the opportunity to de determine what that new use of that site could be. Um, a con of the no project, though, is that we still own a facility that has significant repair needs. and. Uh, capital project is going to be needed at some point in the future to some amount and likely without the same level of assistance from partners. Um, we'll have not the, I shouldn't have put potential to lose our primary tenant. We likely 100% will lose them as an affiliated team, but they may come back as an independent team. It would be economic and community impact loss. The team losing affiliation with no guarantee of that independent league team and uh, significant future investment and efforts going to be required to bring affiliated baseball back to the community if we so desire. Because all these markets, just like us, if they're committing to a big project right now for those 120 teams, they're tethering that team to their market for 15, 20 years. So we're not going to have teams available to move here for quite a while. And uh, we would have a quality of life reduction with the lack of baseball opportunity. Um, questions on that? portion. All right, so moving forward, um, after reviewing the pros and cons of each option, the minimum project is a million dollars more expensive. Full project has the greatest long-term flexibility. Um, we would recommend that if council were to elect to move forward with a project at McCormick Field, then staff would recommend that council consider funding the full project at $37.5 million, contingent upon financial commitment to the project from Buncombe County at a minimum of X dollar amount, successful full award of a grant request from the Tourism Development Product Fund or Tourism Development Authority's Product Development Fund, and execution of the lease with DeWine Seed Silver Dollar Baseball Incorporated, which is the ownership group. Our proposed timeline: We're here today. Uh, we'd be coming back to council on March 14th for a vote. We would submit a letter of commitment to Major League Baseball by the end of March. Uh, the county would include this topic at, on a briefing on March 21st with a vote at their commission meeting on April 6th. We would then take our committed fund from the team, the city, and the county to the uh, Tourism Development Authority at their April meeting 
and present a request to funding for funding for the project. The Product Development Fund Committee would review it throughout the month of May, and they would uh, recommend to the TDA at their May meeting um, where they may or may not fund. Um, and then we're back to the key takeaways where Deborah started. So before we get through there, is any final questions or direction? And I definitely will not be going back through these, but um, I want to pick up on something that Sage said, with, which is to thank Chris for all the hard work, uh, and also DCREF staff, because when Chris was working on these things, somebody had to run Harris Cherokee Center <laughs> and Munich off and uh, all the other facilities that come under his department. So I'm so, so grateful um, for his work. Um, this kind of concludes our presentation, kind of an update of where we are. Essentially, if you want to proceed, staff's perspective about which, um, which avenue, which option you should, should take. And um, we would be coming back. Chris, can you go back to that schedule? Of, yep. Um, a council vote on the 14th of March, unless you all you know, tell us today that you don't want us to go any further on this, but um, we, we would, we would, we think this is a positive path forward and um, think it's something that would benefit the community. I have one question. Maybe I missed it. He may have covered that. Uh, but I was looking here whether you got the 20 year um, commitment from the club for 468 and our commitment from 950,000. Did you actually take into consideration that once that payment is being made where we're getting nothing for the stadium now, that brings in income? Does that reduce our uh, You're talking about the concerts and things? No, no. Yeah, right yeah no, that it's does in include, yeah, that's it everyone's does. commitment. So, so, it, so it does not sort of wash wow. out. No, that, that is our net payment. Plus, plus, plus. What plus, I'm not clear is yeah. if is in there is the two future installments of $4 million. Nor There's, am I clear on the legality of us to promise such for a future council. But It is uh, not in there, um, and I believe it is not possible for you to commit for funds, but yeah. the ask yeah. is really that it get plugged into the capital improvement plan in that timeline, similar to how we have projects listed five years out from now that we have not 100% committed to. But we, but once we do flip debt, I mean, obviously okay. then. We're, and yeah. can I, is it safe to assume that the why is because without incremental significant capital investment as things come up, like we're looking at a 5.6 million has to happen for this facility to keep yeah. functioning line mm -hmm. item right now. We need to be investing regularly real money in our assets and so is that is that kind of why it's that, there? That that's yeah. the goal. There's other markets out there that have invested smaller amounts over time that their needs to meet these standards are significantly less. There's mm -hmm. some clubs less than two million dollars of needs right now, and then there's others that are in that twenty to thirty range, just like us. That I do wonder if end. the entire financial picture changes if if um, the strategy is not lump sums every so often, but an incremental. That really could change the debt service, the amount of interest, all of, all of the actual deep chill financials might change if, if the CapEx plan wasn't big infusions every so often, but incremental. So that would be um, some numbers I'd be curious to see if we could actually bring down the entire interest on the whole project if we had an incremental capital investment strategy. So is that possible? Yeah. Um, well, so we explored one-for-one one grants with the TDA that would come in in year, say, like one, three, five. Uh, the risk with that is if we were not to receive any of those other grants, then we'd be on the hook for the whole thing. So the debt service option was the best option to get long-term commitment from partners to make sure that we didn't come on the hook for more than we bargained for at the beginning. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, it would be cheaper to do lump sums yeah. over time, but that Makes commitment sense. Okay. It's just up in the air. Yeah, we, yeah. we don't want to balloon payment. Right. I understand. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, we have six minutes before our next meeting. So, any? I don't want to cut it short. I, I, um, I'm not at a point of saying no or yes, which means I'd like to see really thoughtful team thoughts today. That I'd like to see some of the information that we've asked for um, in another conversation. So I think the next layer of detail would be would help me get towards my decision making and just appreciate everyone on council's thoughtfulness and 
digging right. into I mean, the right areas. And it, it will be coming back before the full body on March 14th for a vote. So I mean, by then it will, questions will have to have been answered mm -hmm. and asked and some of these things you know, figured I'll, out. I'll share that real quickly. <clears throat> I'm supportive of more information and inquiry into this, but my focal points are around whether or not you and your expertise of other events there can bring us to more of a break even point. And if that triggers any problems with the surrounding neighborhood. Yeah. But so if, and I think it does, I think we, I don't think we can expect to break even. I think yeah. what Chris is doing is finding other ways Towards He's saying better, if you yeah. do this full build out, there are opportunities to make, and I think your slide said up to 550 conservatively right. a year. So but saving more money, but my concern is if that triggers problems in the neighborhood and how we will know that information before March. Right, well, and I think we're going to have to go talk with the neighborhood and figure out okay. what, is there a way to reinvest in a neighborhood that would make that version of this workable or not? I, I mean, want to. I want to say yes to this, but I do still have some legal questions that are in my list of twenty-seven questions about what's possible, about what we can contract in. For example, on the construction, um, those aren't going to get answered today. But I want to be able to say yes. I just still need some answers to like what's possible in tying in community benefits into the contract. Okay. Anything? I think we're good. Okay. All right. We're adjourned. Thank you. Four minutes.